The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Hope Housing Fund Management Limited, ABN 24629589939 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things, the right time, the right way for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Hope Housing is championing the great Aussie dream for everyday heroes, police, nurses, paramedics, teachers and more by reinventing the way they buy homes. Hope's shared equity housing model means you can now gain exposure to a portfolio of vetted residential assets in high growth metropolitan areas through one investment without the hassle of being a landlord and at the same time enable affordable home ownership for frontline workers. It's the win-win Australia needs right now. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and assets class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also that work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature. Here we go. Housing. It's finally, we've finally got the housing one in front of us. It's finally come to this. One of the biggest elephants in the biggest room, and we finally get to do the podcast on it. What may, what moves it? What stops it? What makes it go up? What doesn't make it go down? Is it a bubble? And does it matter? We're looking at the Aussie housing market today, the barriers and the opportunities. We'll answer some of your questions today and figure out Some smart ways to invest for your clients and maybe for yourself. We're going to start big picture and then zoom into Australia, look at some of the regulatory issues, and then we're going to have a look at some of the investment strategies. There's a lot to get through, so I'm not going to take much of a breath as we go forward. Fortunately, we have experts on the minutiae and also experts in portfolio allocation, and I couldn't ask for two better names to help us out with this one today. I am joined by Jessica Alerm from Hope Housing, who is the head of investor engagement there, and Bianca Rose from Morningstar, Portfolio Manager. Bianca, joining us again um, on the podcast. Great to see you. How are you now? Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem at all. Well, it's, uh, thank you for helping us with the podcast here as well. Let's let's just go through it as well. So Morningstar is Morningstar. That's okay. Hope housing is a new one for me. Would you like to run us through, Jessica? Everyone gets the same sort of question I do, and it's not being blunt. What do you do and how do you make money? Great question. So Yes, correct. I head up investor engagement at Hope Housing. We make equity injections into houses owned and occupied by essential workers. So we are a residential housing fund. And, you know, the beauty of our model for investors is through our fund, they can get unitized exposure to the capital growth of the Australian housing market uh, with none of the hassles of being a landlord. Okay. Thank you for joining us in there. And what's new at Morningstar? Uh, so I continue to do multi-asset <laughs> investing. Um, and so, yeah, we've been, you know, tracking the residential real estate as it's kind of moving in more into the commercial property realm, if you like. Okay. So now I'm going to start with Morningstar. Let's go big picture. We've, we've, we've been in a rate hike cycle now, which has seen the top, not to give too, too specific a, a, a detail on this. We're now sort of heading in and, and our housing markets around the world appear to have not been affected at all by anywhere between Three, four, five percent feels like interest rate increases. The U.S. market hasn't really moved that much. 
it's differently differently driven. different markers yeah <laughs> uh canadia has uh has gone <laughs> oh, i i i'm always going to error it that way so i'm just going to say it canadia um, but the canada house of market is just anyway anyway i'll go i'll go with you big picture what's been moving the market so continually and stubbornly upwards despite uh rate hikes uh, so I think, you know, a, a few things. So I think the housing supply um, is definitely still an issue. There is a shortage versus demand. Mm -hmm. I think um, we've probably seen a lot in media uh, recently of a new tapped uh, source being the mum and dad bank. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it seems like every time that something in terms of funding gets, you know, tapped, whether it's now interest rates are rising so you can't tap the banking uh, kind of source, you find a new source to, to find that way to afford the home. Um, so I think, yeah, those are the kind of common things that I'm seeing. Yeah, we have seen some weakness in commercial. Now, this is we're talking about residentials today, but uh, but the commercial space has seen a little bit of trouble, hasn't it? Definitely. Um, you know, particularly in the office. I think we saw retail, um, you know, get hard hit during COVID. That started to recover, and now office is really the one that's under pressure. Um, and that's not just in Australia, but worldwide. Yeah, I I think that there's probably still something to come in the CRE space that has yet to really shine uh, shine as brightly as it could. There's, there's certain areas. I mean, the, the, the devaluation in some of the commercial property spaces is still ongoing and I think probably still has a little bit more to go. There's one big crack that probably is going to appear. Yeah, I think it, like every kind of sector, there's probably two speeds. There's the, the parts that will be fine mm. um, and there will be the parts that are probably not in great locations and becomes a spiralling effect. Um, from an occupancy point of view, I guess, you know, the two parts that we look at is obviously the the fundamentals or the occupancy, but we also look at the debt. And that's probably, I guess, the key of real estate versus maybe some other um, asset classes where we really look at as as well as not just the fundamentals, but we look at, okay, what's happening to debt? And for those guys that are probably a little bit more leveraged than they should be, mm -hmm. that kind of also will be uh, something to watch. Well, speaking of leverage, a beautiful segue <laughs> to the Australian market. Um, I know myself. If I, I'm right to the eyeballs with me and my place. So it's it's now uh, we could flick over to to you, Jessica, mm. to talk about the Australian market that's mm. here. How are you? What what is what's been the main or either of you really? What have been the main drivers here? I mean, it's 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 pretty obvious, one, but we've got to get to it. Yeah, well, just to pick up on where Bianca was was talking to around the challenges in office, and then I think how they parlay themselves into what we're seeing in residential. So. Um, in the lead up to COVID, we had a, a gradual increase in people working from home. And then obviously we saw that hugely spike in an during the pandemic. Yeah, just one afternoon. <laughs> yeah, the Sorry. ABS was tracking something like 40%, you know, were working at least one day a week from home. Yep. So, you know, that's an average, right? So yep. us office workers had the luxury of working at home. Our essential workers obviously didn't. Mm. But even after um, the pandemic has, you know, effectively ended, that trend has, has continued. It's fallen back slightly. But I think what that's driving is trends for people to look at where they live and think about, well, it's not just where I live anymore. It has to also accommodate an office, potentially an office for both, you know, people and a couple, mm. for a family, a space away from kids. So I think that's, you know, part of what's, you know, driving, you know, not just the only thing that's driving, but part of the, one of the trends that's driving uh, residential property right now. But on the topic of leverage, it is really fascinating because, yes, some of us are, probably feel very highly leveraged, right? And mm. That goes to the dy dynamics of the property market and resi not being homogeneous. And so um, if we look at the overall leverage in Australia, um, you know, across the broad resi sector, it sits at around mid-20s, low-20s, and that's core logic data. And I think to Bianca's point, there's a lot of wealth locked up in the baby boomers and the mums and dads, and we're now seeing that through, you know, living wealth transfer push into the resi market. Yeah, we did have a previous podcast on that, on the movement of wealth from mm. uh, from one generation to the next. And I think there's probably some some people who are younger than I am who are really looking forward to that date coming up when it does happen, if it happens and if it doesn't get taxed too much. Yeah, but I think, I think um, you know, parents are doing it now mm. while they're alive. They're not waiting for that moment. They're looking at their kids suffering and, you know, this incredibly unstable rental market. And they're saying, well, if I can help you get on the ladder now through, you know, releasing some equity in my home or giving you a cash top up, I'll do that. Okay. Well, we've got a few questions that are here from, from people on the Ensemble platform. And I think that with the amount that there is in front of me, we might as well just get straight into it. Um, okay, so we've looked at at the housing in Australia at the moment, um, what's caused and driven it. Uh, do you want to talk about supply? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a supply-demand story pretty yeah. much. I think the latest data that came out from CoreLogic this morning points to that. It's structurally embedded as a challenge in Australia across our capital cities. Um, 
you know, 50% of Australia's population live in one of those three eastern seaboard mm. cities. That's very different to how it, it looks in America and the UK, where you have a population far less densified in certain regions. So we're seeing immense pressure from a supply perspective in areas like Brisbane, mm -hmm. uh, at Sydney, obviously. Melbourne's a little bit different because I'm sure we're going to touch on this later, but Melbourne's had some policy and tax setting changes yes. that, have, that have changed some of the dynamics. Also, a lot of apartments in Melbourne, um, so slightly different to Sydney. But yeah, certainly I think we're, we're seeing building approvals, you know, yes, come through, but completions are the real thing to look at and completions are really not um, happening because of the, you know, embedded costs in the construction supply chain. No problem at all. Now, the impact of inflation, this is, I'm just going to go straight off the questions and anyone who go to the macro, uh, the ensemble uh, the ensemble platform and put in any, any further questions for future podcasts so we can pile them together and make them for entertainment purposes and for advice purposes like this as well. What impact have inflation and interest rates had on the Australian market? Uh, so an obvious one. Who wants to handle the obvious question? <laughs> I'll let Bianca <laughs> I mean, have a view. But... I, you know, it's obviously, you know, impacted obviously interest rates, but also the construction costs. Like they're up 20, 30%, um, you know, in the last 18 months or so. Um, I think they're starting to stabilise, but obviously, um, so not just from the construction materials, but tradespeople. Um, so all of that is leading to, so not only if the, you know, government releases land, but just to build new construction and dwellings is, is a real barrier. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I think there's something like a 90,000 skills shortage in labor to meet the construction demand, um, to meet the supply, sorry, that yeah. we need to actually house our booming population. And, and then we will get to the government side. We are going to talk about the regulations and the government side in just a second when we get there. Cause I want to talk about governments actually helping to, to move some of that supply. Mm. Um, and to and to generate there it is, and whether or not they should actually be doing that that's a different question that's it uh so we have talked about where where residential and real estate investments are performing well. We talked about Brisbane, we talked about Sydney anywhere else nice well, spots Perth. In Perth. absolutely, and yeah. then I think it comes down to when you know investors are looking at you know their performance they're probably going to be looking at their rental yields as well as their capital growth. Mm -hmm. certainly you've got markets where rental yields are, are very healthy, and that's in some of those more regional areas that might be exposed to significant economic, you know, a, a new mine per se or something significant for that region. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, capital growth, you're looking at Perth and, and Brisbane, but Sydney is, I think, close to retracing its, you know, highs. So even after that dip off after the the boost during the pandemic, yeah. not far off. No, that's that's right. I, well, we saw that rates haven't haven't had the impact that I think that a lot of people thought that they were going to have. There's a few commentators that were out there calling for, Massive corrections. I won't name who that person individual is, but he loves to make a headline for himself. He, g'day if you're listening. He, I know he is. So he, he doesn't listen to anything except for I his own voice. Wink, we say not, that for the video. <laughs> no, okay. um, look, I, don't, I don't want to cause any. I don't want to make any more enemies in this market. But it it it, it didn't have the impact that it had. Is it, could it still be if if rates too hold at these? Yeah, levels? I mean it's not an end story. It's not an end, right? It's oh, a we bit like the done. office. You were just talking about office. Yeah. You know, in it, whether a shoe still well. I think there is yeah. still some distress and some people are holding on, yeah. right? Um, and it depends on expiries with, you know, um, loans. Some people are fixed and then there's a lot of commentary about that moving off. Yep, the last one. Um, yeah. So, you know, there is some distress. Um, it's, it's just, I think, just trickling through and whether they can hold on and then when does the interest rate cycle turn? When does the interest rate cycle turn? Mm -hmm. I right. think, yeah, I mean, I would also say look at owner occupiers versus landlords and who's feeling the interest rate pressure. So, CoreLogic's pain and gain report, um, I think it was for the uh, March quarter, showed that 10% of uh, investor owned properties sold at a loss, and that was higher than owner occupiers. So, I think to your point, Bianca, owner occupiers will do whatever they can to hold on because yep. to try and reestablish a foot in this market is challenging. Yep. Whereas, you know, a landlord might say, well, it's time to just cut my losses and redeploy that capital elsewhere, you know? Yeah. There's only so many times that they could raise rents before they realize exactly. that, that. Or we'll get into the regulations on that in just a second as well. Um, okay. Yes, we've talked about that. What are the megatrends which are causing the market to behave this way? We sort of talked about megatrends. Mean trends, yes. So from, I mean, there'll be probably be two sides to it. I don't know, Bianca, if you have a view on the commercial side, surely there's mega trends in that piece, but maybe I'll talk to some of the ones that we view in the resi residential space. So um, the first one I'll probably talk to, which drives capital growth into the long term, and maybe just to step back a bit, it's helpful to think about well, what capital growth has been historically. 
And when you sort of quote figures like 9% in the Sydney market, you know, 10% over, you know, since 1926 to now across Australia, it can be quite challenging for people to actually sit back and believe that number. Certainly when we meet with, you know, potential investors, it's it's sort of, it's quite a stat that almost floors them a little bit that Mm -hmm. it could have been that long run average. And the question we always get is, well, why will that continue into the future? Surely that can't keep happening. Um, But I think that's where you really start to unpick, well, what are those mega trends that are coming through that will continue to support sustained capital growth? So the first one we think about are demographics. And I think that talks to um, who's in the workforce, the increasing number of women participating in the workforce. We still actually haven't reached parity and we certainly haven't reached parity in terms of equal pay. You know, we nationally we're sitting at a 12% pay gap, mm-hmm. but actually structurally in, in, inside certain pockets, that can be as high as 26%, especially when you factor in women are not often working full time, they're seeking more flexible time, time off for raising children. So I think that's a driving force in household income and household income translates into borrowing power long term. The second big demographic one for us in terms of capital growth is we're living longer and we're staying in the workforce longer. And so we're seeing an increasing number of post-55, even over 65-year-olds choose to remain in the workforce. We're also seeing them reskilling. And that, again, is going to support a longer duration, holding that property, more time to pay off your mortgage, being able to accommodate larger debt debt inside that sort of housing structure. Then we move on to population. I think it's been no secret because it's obviously been a hot topic in the media of the immense uh, population growth we've seen, especially in the last year, a massive influx of new migrants. And um, we will see that reset. We will see that reset. But I think one of the um, important points to call out is um, when we do reset down to that 235, 250 range, which is in the budget, we will still be significantly above our long run migration rate pre-COVID. So migration is not going away. It will soften compared to where we were last year, but it will still be a huge driver. The other thing around um, population is who's coming to Australia. We are actually now the, the top destination, believe it or not, for millionaires. And that probably doesn't come as much of a surprise when you think about the geopolitical instability across Europe and other regions and Australia's incredible lifestyle and relative stability and good education, all these other regions, reasons that drive high net worth um, to look at this this market. Sure. Um, I'll touch briefly on wealth transfer because it sounds like you've covered that before, but yeah. $4.9 trillion living inheritance, mum and dad, banker mum and dad, helping out the kids. <laughs> Uh, and then government policies. I'm not sure if you want me to go into that yet. We're about ready to. I was just going to check with Bianca if she, if, if there were any mega trends that you're seeing and that the morning morning start uh, keeping uh, abreast of. Yeah. So I think like if we look wider commercial real estate, obviously there's been a lot about industrial versus retail. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as well, you mentioned returns where we're looking more and more about where that return composition is coming from. So maybe something you know helpful for for listeners is to kind of think about. In the past, I think there's a lot coming from rental yield um, and less from capital return. I think today it's now more about capital return. Um, And so you really do have to be on top of those that demand supply imbalance to kind of say, if you're not going to rely so much on that income yield, which is, you know, traditional, and you're relying on that capital gain, well, you know, what's going to drive that and kind of pick your spots there. Okay. Yeah. All right, now we can talk about government regulation and and, and government policy. Everyone's favourite topic. I'm just going to go. It's, it's, <laughs> but it's so it's so vital to to what is going on in different parts of the world. We will talk about Victoria because this is going to be interesting. So I'm I'm sticking with the questions here. I get told very stubbornly and so very sternly, James. <laughs> you have to stick to the questions. Don't go off piste. I know you're watching. How have recent government policies helped or hindered home ownership? That's a broad question. Whoever wants to go first can go first. Yeah, I mean, I'll just talk maybe about stamp duty to start with. And I think stamp duty, as we've seen housing prices increase in stamp duty is now in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a big impediment to mobility. Yeah. So it used to be that, you know, it wasn't a problem if you, you know, wanted to move house. Now, a lot of time people are just sticking where they are because it's, it's a really big decision to to spend that kind of money versus before. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's one area. I know, you know, we can talk about uh, Victoria residential, um, you know, real estate getting taxed a little bit differently. I would say we're seeing the same feature though in other um, parts of the, you know, retail off, you know, retail and office where Victoria is also taxing, you know, more of the shopping malls, say versus New South Wales. So it's not just um, resi, (laughs) um, uh, residential, um, it's also some other sectors that, you know, different states have have different policies. Yeah. Stamp duty, your thoughts? Look, I think, you know, 
people are pricing stamp duty into the way they're thinking about buying a property. It's mm. been around for so long, it's mm. almost just part of the fabric of buying a property. Certainly, stamp duty relief has helped certain sections of the market, but it's less than what you would think. Because if you look at Sydney, for example, I think stamp duty relief on a on a on an owner occupier caps out at around six hundred thousand. You know, so um, or possibly it's I think it, no six hundred thousand and below. I think you get no stamp duty, and then it's tiered slightly. Yeah, it used to be five hundred thousand. Yeah, I think that might have increased it. I actually don't know. I'm allowed to not know things. Yeah, but I think you know (laughs) these these policies around helping first homeowners step into the space are important because if we just rely on the narrative around well we must build more and we must have more supply, we're looking at a generation, if not more, of owner occupiers completely locked out of the market. Now, why is that challenging for Australia? Well, it's incredibly challenging for the retirement prospects and the fiscal impact on the budget 30, 40 years from now. Mm. Because, you know, owning your home is well recognized as a third pillar of our you know, retirement and superannuation system. If you don't own your own home, if you don't have super and you don't have the pension, you're you're in a troubled state. Mm. And some, you know, politicians and commentators have gone so far as to say owning a home is even more beneficial in some regards than having superannuation. Because yeah. when you are in retirement, you know, and you're renting, well, that's fine pre-retirement when you've got income coming through the door, but that really drops off as soon as you retire. So not having housing costs is a huge um, driver of not living in rental uh, poverty, a uh, retirement poverty. So I think, you know, you've got the government obviously stepping in with the half and they're really trying to drive supply, but there are also important measures to drive what is important in the here and now. And that's things like stamp duty relief, um, the first homeowner's grant, the first homeowner's guarantee, so that ability to not have to have LMI if you fall under certain caps. Mm -hmm. And then the government um, in most states has now stepped in with their own shared equity programs too. So I suppose similar to what we're doing at Hope, um, but it's shared equity for the lower income, more affordable into the spectrum. Okay, land tax in Victoria. Yeah, land tax in Victoria, I think that's, hitting people very hard. So that came in at the start of this year. I'm sure many people on the call will have had clients exposed to it, if not themselves, as investors in, in Melbourne. We saw a massive rush uh, to, to the to the sales door at the end of last year. I mm-hmm. think roughly 23 to 25% of all sales were attributed to land tax. Mm-hmm. So, you know, come getting ahead of that January 1st change. Yep. Um, but yeah. Weird putting us anyway, go on. But yeah, so that reduction of three hundred thousand to fifty thousand in terms of, you know, the threshold yeah. has certainly made owning a second property relatively untenable yep. for a lot of people. And, you know, usually it is just one extra property property. You know, seventy percent of Australia's property investors own just one property. Yeah. Which I think that China China uh, this is one of those things that uh, I don't think that maybe the CCP is where we should be pulling our policy from, but they do have one policy and and the President Z Again, I'm not supporting anything else that, that he does, but it was very interesting the way that he said that property should be for living, not for investing or, or, or speculation. And that's the way that they do it over there in China. Whatever, you can talk about the Chinese property market for as long as you like, but it's not a bad ethos to have um, that maybe it should be more, a little bit more difficult for people to own multiple homes. Maybe two is okay. Well, I suppose we're going to have that trial in Victoria. Right? Yeah, we're and going so to see how that goes. I'm sure the rest of the states will be watching closely if we could pr- to pr- see how that plays out. Potentially trial it in a state that didn't blow itself up during COVID might have been uh, a better idea. Um, it's I go I go through Melbourne and I see it's definitely not the place that it used to be. It's a real it's a real shame. It makes me upset. The way, just the way they went through COVID. But anyway, so now they're trying to get back to that by taxing people. Effectively. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> no, all I would say maybe um, on, on China, I think, yeah, the, you know, the points are really that the, a lot of those places were used as a store of wealth and empty. I think in Sydney, you know, <laughs> it would be hard-pressed given where our, our you know, rental kind of uh, rates are, the yeah. vacancy rates, to find too many houses that are empty at the moment. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that, that's Yeah, that's true. I mean, it is a delicate – I mean, yeah, one little move – does really uh, the butterfly wings do really uh, create hurricanes in the Australian market? If if they do anything, it just it feels. I've, I've got a theory. Hang on, this year I'm going to get into it. Just apologies for this. I've got a theory that so I'm a financial advisor, and the amount of CPD that I'm required to uh, accrue, and the amount of education that I need to have to be able to do it, exams I've needed to pass, everything like that. To be a real estate agent, you don't really require that much. And I've got a theory that if they brought in more regulations and more regulatory overs- oversight of the Australian property market, you would see some serious, serious fall downs. And that's that's probably one of the reasons why. It's just so tenuous to a savage correction. 
not to, but I mean, if rates couldn't bring it down, then I suppose it doesn't. I'm sort of rambling here, aren't I? No, I, is it, is it? I agree. I think it is quite um, tenuous, and I think you can see that um, more broadly with like um, property because it's a leverage asset class, mm. and so the minute it, it does, you know, go one way, it becomes a snowball because. I mean, we talk about, you know, what's the tipping point um, for leverage and, and so on. So it is a bit tricky. Um, it is one of those things. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, I think, you know, underquoting is still an issue yes. out there. You know, we definitely see with the p- properties we're purchasing, um, you know, very different outcomes yeah. to what was quoted by the real estate agent yeah. to the prospective homeowner. Um, you know, so that's sometimes feels like it's skirting very closely to. There's, th- there's, there's things that you feel that probably if I, if I, if I told someone straight up that this $2 million purchase in your own name is going to be the best investment you've ever made and basically guarantee that myself without actually guaranteeing it myself, if I said that to a client about buying BHP, I, I, I would never work again. I'd never get another job. Mm-hmm. Real, estate, real estate guys get to do that. I'm, very, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm really bitter about that. It's a financial product. Yeah, right? see, that's, that's right. It's, like it's, a big, it's, it's the biggest deposit around people are going to make. Yeah, even though I think it's you know 10.4 or $10.6 trillion asset class, it's eight times the size of commercial, four times the size of super. It's huge, right? It's being financialized in many respects, hasn't it? You can see how bitter I am about this, can't you? Uh, okay, let's go on. Now, speaking of investing, this is, why I've, this is why I mentioned it, so that we could segue to the investment side of things. So what are the current models for investment? I'm still with the questions. I'm still with the questions. What are the current models and how have they performed? The models for investing in, in, in real estate in Australia. Yeah, well, I think everyone's familiar with the direct approach, right? Yeah. I probably well, don't need to spend too much time. No, 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 we've, we've, we've mentioned it. I'm just saying how the direct approach, you know, it served, you know, most investors well over the past 50 years. A great store of wealth and has supported many retirees, um, you know, post the, their working careers. But but it's under pressure and I think, you know, that that land tax hike in Victoria is proving that, right? You know, people are running for the doors and it's compressing capital growth. So I think, you know, people are starting to look around at other models. Uh, You know, you've got the shared equity model, which ourselves and a few other funds are now standing up. And that's, you know, not coming in as an investor in the direct landlord sense, but actually putting your equity alongside a homeowner who gets all of the privileges homeowners in Australia get as owner occupiers. So Mm -hmm. principal place of residence, land tax exemption, Um, all of these, you know, I'm living in the property, I'm taking care of it like an owner, not like a tenant. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, all of those hassles around managing a property are, go, go away in this model where your equity sits alongside an owner-occupier. Plus, you know, I think the ability to diversify. I think I mentioned earlier, Australian residential property investors in the direct model are, tend to be highly concentrated. In some of these you know, unitized structures, you get immediate diversification. So it's almost like an ETF in many ways. Yep. Um, but aside from that, and I'm sure Bianca will talk to this, but, you know, we're seeing the build to rent sector really emerge. I was just going to mention build to rent. Exactly. Spearheaded by institutional investors. So I, I think Bianca is probably far better placed to speak to that one than I am. But, Go for it. Uh, I mean, yeah, Mervac and Stockland obviously are getting in on the act. So it's been a, a thing definitely for many, many years in the US and, and Germany and Japan. Uh, we, you know, you, uh, really we've had a build to sell market where you build it and then you sell it, you get your, your profit and then you move on. Um, really those guys are now starting. So Mervac and Stockland are starting to look at build to rent. Um, they're mainly looking at apartments, not houses so much. Um, and from what I hear as well, they are looking at more the high end. So not really solving the problem for, I guess, those people that, you know, can't afford the high end stuff and are just trying to get into the property market. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really is. So that they can get um, quite nice returns, they are kind of looking for a more premium end of the market. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's just, we're going to keep going. Any other new models that are out? For- well, look, there's been SDA for a while. So oh. obviously that's disability housing. Yes. So you can invest in funds that, you know, maybe partnering with operators, maybe operators themselves, yep. but you're sort of bespoke housing, you know, that that's set up with funding and from the NDIS that yep. supports some of those models. Do you um, see those lasting? Well, I suppose they're tightly linked to policy yeah. settings, aren't they? So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion at the moment about the NDIS and cost blowouts, and yeah. that will have a trickle down effect into the packages that NDIS recipients receive. Yeah. And that will then have a flow on effect into um, some of these models that are reliant on some of those packages. So, yeah. look, I think just like any investment, there's always risk, but that certainly, I think, has a government regulation policy risk associated with it. Mm-hmm. No, no, that just I, I, I don't think it's going to last. Mm. I've just got this sort of little anchoring to thinking that the NDIS has just probably gone a little bit too far. A um, lot of anecdotal on that one, though. Um, and that's absolutely not a definite thing. That's just me sort of thinking it to myself here. Advisors are starting to see more clients buy property with friends. What 
are the benefits and risks of doing this. Mm. Rent vesting and co-ownership. I mean, this is a fascinating trend. You know, I've got friends that have done this as well. I don't know, Bianca, if you know anyone that's done it. Just reading an article the other day where three families, you know, bought in this big apartment together. So, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, Australians are, you know, entrepreneurial in how they approach, you know, housing just as much as many other aspects of Australian culture. And I think because it's ingrained in our psyche that owning a home is so important because mm. of that retirement effect, people are looking at different ways to achieve. And there's a lot of startups now that are coming out that are catering to some of these models. Um, but I, I saw a really interesting stat recently, and it's not a perfect correlation, but CBA, I think, saw that 46% of the people that came onto their books as property investors last year were millennials. Now, that seems quite high because typically in Australia, you know, buying an investment property has been something you maybe do a little bit later in life once you've actually got the first, you know, your primary residence sorted. Mm. But, you know, people can't afford to buy where they want to live in Sydney, for example, and other markets. So they're buying in the regions, they're buying in Brisbane, um, they're buying in different areas of Sydney and they're rent vesting. So they're renting those units and yep. houses and yep. living where they want to live. And yep. I think that's going to increase and you'll see more and more products um, come to the fore that support that and potentially more horror stories, I imagine, you know. Yeah, I mean, you're, <laughs> you know, you're co-investing with other people that could potentially uh, pose a credit risk, you know. Yeah. Um, or they you my to, yeah. you know, sell out and you get some new neighbour that you didn't really want. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there are, you know, numerous ways that whenever you have to share with someone uh, <laughs> that it can go wrong. As well as right. Well, I'll, and we'll just I'll just go off piece a little bit here, just talking about the investment side of things. When and this is a, a great question for Morningstar, um, so help us out with this one if you can, Bianca. But when when you're picking the investment timing of this, what are you looking for on that side? We haven't really covered that. When when you're when are your entries? When are your exits? Or when do you go overweight and underweight? In, yeah, in in Resi. So the way, um, well, we don't do it at Resi's level. We do it at real estate level. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so primarily when we're looking at, say, even some of our big institutional clients, we'll look at unlisted property as a core exposure, mm-hmm. if you like, and then we'll choose to be strategically overweight or underweight through a REIT allocation because that's the listed side. So that's you know because typically, say, if I'm going to go into the unlisted property area, you can't pick and choose your timing there. Um, and a lot of the time it is very much a long-term investment. Yeah. Um, and, and generally I find that you there's no problem adding to the investment, but there's a problem <laughs> reducing. And usually yeah. you want to reduce when you think it's going to go down and that's not the way you can yeah. time it. So yeah. you, you probably want to do it via the REITs. So that's how we tend to, to look at it is that we kind of tend to split it up and use the REITs for tactical Got positioning. It. Yep. No, that makes a lot of sense. So what, is, uh, what other real estate options exist which are outside the square but have a positive impact. Now, I think that we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about positive impact of, of investing. So what, what else can you go into in that? So I think, you know, green housing is yep. really interesting. We've seen that, you know, the green- Just for anyone who's only listening, she did little air quote, air bunnies, things like that. We just, we just, <laughs> we just said- just, uh, I, It wasn't to say it wasn't green. But <laughs> <laughs> that they are using that to, to say that it is, okay? Yeah. Just so, um, you know, I think we've seen neighbours for a long time in commercial, right? And, yes. you know, rating commercial buildings on their energy efficiency. Yeah. But that's something where there really isn't a standardised approach in residential. But certainly when there's been research done to look at what type of uplift that could have, it is quite significant. So um, QBE, many of you will know, big LMI provider, insurer, they did some research um, a few years ago and they looked at what greening a residential property did for the capital growth uplift. And they found a premium of around 10% on a green residential home. Now that's really fascinating because that was a few years ago. You think about where we are now in terms of cost of living, um, you know, energy costs, and consumers out there in the market, they're actually selecting properties where they are, you know, are going to actually, from that asset level, have a much more material impact on their household budget. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, people, whether you have a property of your own or whether you have an investment property, you know, that's something to maybe be thinking about. You know, how could I green my property? I'm going to have a positive impact at an environmental level, but yeah. probably also quite a positive social impact. Yeah, and that's that's important as well. How do you put, and this is a question for both of you, and I think that that's got us through our questions here. How do you add, how best can you add the ESG element to an investment in real estate? I'll let Bianca tell one first. Yeah, so (laughs) so we do look at um, the green ratings and so on. I think for us, generally, we find it's much cheaper to do via brand new buildings and to retrofit. Um, A lot of the time, retrofitting is a lot more costly and you still get a suboptimal outcome 
Um, so that's kind of been our, um, you know, general kind of observation, if you like. But we do see a premium and even more overseas. We're seeing that more expand and we think that trend will happen here. I hope so. ESG? Yeah. So I suppose, uh, you know, just speaking from a bit of experience, obviously from hope, you know, helping families that can't get onto the housing ladder to be able to buy a home mm-hmm. is an incredible S in the ESG story. Um, you know, especially when as an investor into some structure like that, um, can it equally benefit from a financial perspective? You know, you're not having to give up anything or discount anything to still achieve your return, but you can obviously play a role in a great social outcome. Mm-hmm. So I think if we look at invest, you know, if someone's really passionate about that and you're looking at investment opportunities on the market, where we're helping those people step into home ownership that otherwise couldn't, I think, you know, that's really powerful. And, you, you know, to give you some sense of how to measure that, so we do actually track, you know, what that impact is on coming from a rental situation to owning a home to living close closer to where you work, which is a huge um, you know, mental impact on someone when they own a home, not having to do a significant commute. Uh, and we tracked across our portfolio of essential workers a 13.5% impact return. Oh, really? So it's, yeah. So I think, you know, there are options now. You don't have to just be in property for one reason. You can find your flavor of what interests you and, and take that investment. Bianca, anything else? Um, I will also add... But I think there are other uh, segments of the real estate market, like we're looking at healthcare as well as another um, area of, of, you know, um, social real estate. So, uh, you know, yes, it's very, um, you know, admirable to to do it in residential where people live and it's really, really important. But we are looking at um, some other areas that are also catering to those megatrends of ageing population and things like that. Um, Yeah. Yes, that, and that is one of the megatrends that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, I am going to need to close it off here unless anyone has anything else to add. Otherwise, no. no. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on this amazing podcast uh, and anyone who was watching as well. Um, cheers for that. Uh, I've been James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I was joined here by Jessica Elam. I have, did, I, did I pronounce that? You right? actually got it perfect, which was very impressive. Jessica Elam of, uh, how do you pronounce it? Hope Housing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, Bianca Rose from Morningstar, thank you for joining us again. Uh, This has been an ensemble investment podcast brought to you by Morningstar. Thank you very much. I'm now going to go and cough, which I finally wanted to do for the first time in an hour. I was so sorry about that. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have yourself a great day. Thanks, James.